Chapter 41. Rejected. Things had not gone well for Jake. The fearful sight of Jesus Christ enthroned in such glory filled him with overwhelming dread, not joy. Looking around at all the people standing near him in the vast multitude, Jake saw Brett close by and Abby ahead of him. Abby isn't baptized, he thought. But she's still young. Will she be accountable to God? Will God allow her to live out her mortal existence? He could see that she was crying in great despair. Has she already been judged unfaithful? Why didn't I help Abby? Why did I despise her for going out with Brian? And what about David and Nathan? It dawned on Jake that while he had been pursuing his own selfish plans, drowning in apathy, his friends in the youth group had been slipping away. Jake felt conscience-stricken. How he wished he had followed his brother's good lead and immersed himself in God's word. If only he had spent the summer cleansing his mind and allowing it to be transformed by God's spirit power, perhaps now he wouldn't be feeling so distraught. How foolish his basketball dream seemed compared to God's promise of forever. The provincials would never happen now. All that time spent training had been for naught. He could have gone to the Bible camp and filled his mind with good things as Zach had done. Instead, he had spent countless hours cramming for tests and training for a basketball championship that would never come. It had all taken him away from being prepared for the return of Christ. Melissa had been a terrible mistake. Yet perhaps he could still throw himself on the mercy of Christ. I'll take you back, came rushing into his mind. It was his favorite song. It gave him hope. Jesus is a friend of sinners, he told himself. He'll take back anyone who throws themselves upon his mercy. That was all he could rely on now. Please, he begged the angel when he was called to give an account. I was wrong. I didn't realize Jesus was coming back so soon. I always wanted to change my life. I'll do anything you say now. Please forgive me. As the angel recounted his sins, his unforgiven sins, that had not been confessed in prayer or forsaken, Jake felt increasing anguish. Jake, the angel said compassionately, you did well to be baptized and to commit your way to God. You started off on the right path, and all the angels rejoiced when you gave your life to God. But you didn't continue. You allowed yourself to slide into apathy and indifference. You knew your heart was slipping away from God, and you chose to give it over even more fully to the world. You didn't care for the weak in your ecclesia. You despised them. Your example made it harder for them to come to God. They looked at you for leadership and were led even further astray. But all my good friends in the truth abandoned me. Jake pleaded. I needed a good friend, a strong friend. And you took all my friends away. My whole ecclesia was apathetic. The talks were so boring. I wasn't getting the help that I needed. The angel looked at him soberly. Was your cross heavier than the one your Lord had to bear? No, Jake answered weakly. Suddenly, all his excuses seemed pitiful, hardly worth mentioning. Jake, God sent trials into your life to make you stronger, the angel told him. Today, your family is entering the kingdom. They endured many of the same trials. They wanted to help you, but even if you had been truly all alone in your ecclesia, Jesus and I were working with you every day. Had you chosen to seek God's message in his word, we were right there, longing to help you grow in faith. There was so little that we could do for you, because you weren't begging for God's help. Had you prayed more often, had you given God the time you spent on excessive exercise, worldly entertainment, and immoral living, we could have showed you God's power to answer prayer. Instead, the angel reminded him firmly, you not only chose to fill your mind with corruption, you tried to fill your brothers with the same. But we were only watching pictures, Jake pleaded. Choosing to defile your mind is sinful, the angel told him, and you know where it led you. God is looking for hearts that love his ways, not the ways of the world. He wants immortal beings that will teach this evil world to cast off wickedness and love God's righteousness. God has seen that in your heart you love iniquity. It didn't vex your soul. 
you indulged in it vicariously and gave yourself over to sin. Then why didn't you stop me? Jake pleaded, thinking of how his brother's concussions had taken him out of action and started him on the path to God. Why didn't you hit me on the head? Then maybe I could have made other choices like Zack did. Jake, you had already made a commitment to your Heavenly Father. You had already promised at your baptism to put the flesh to death and strive to follow Jesus. Your decision to sin willfully was offensive to God. Yet we tried in many ways to turn you around, the angel assured him earnestly. You were given a way out of every temptation. Brett offered you a way out, but you chose physical fitness over spiritual growth. Your brother's change of heart should have pricked your conscience, but you became resentful. Even when you recognized how positive the Bible camp had been for your brother, you chose financial gains over preparing for a week that you knew would help you spiritually. And finally, Jake, in a last attempt to bring you to your senses, we allowed your uncle's health to deteriorate. For me? Jake shuddered. Un uncle James suffered f for me? And I never visited him once. We hoped that through your uncle's sickness, you would see the fragility of life and reconsider the path you were following. The angel explained sadly. God is looking for people who willingly choose to serve him and love his ways. He doesn't force anyone to do right or wrong, but he does test hearts. But I thought that Jesus loves us and wants to save us. Jake pleaded foolishly, feeling his hope for mercy was rapidly slipping away. Jesus forgave people who have done much worse than I have. Why can't he forgive me? I'm so young. I'm hardly even old enough to be responsible to him. Surely God can see that I'm sorry. Can't I just live out my life as a mortal in the kingdom and have one more chance? I'm so young. The angel shook his head firmly. Jesus has tried you and knows that you don't love him, Jake. Your heart is with the world. You love the things of the flesh. You made a promise in baptism that you forsook. The door of opportunity for forgiveness and eternal life was open every day. Until now. Your Lord Jesus Christ and I have grieved over the choices you've made, Jake. Try as we did to reach out to you. You would have none of us. You you talked to Jesus about, about me? Jake sobbed. You were, you were working in my life? What a fool I've been for turning away. He thought. The angel has tried to show me the path of righteousness through my brother and my uncles. I can see it all so clearly now. Yes, Jake. Since the day you were born, I've conferred with our Lord Jesus about you many times. Wait! Jake cried feebly, knowing he was about to be dismissed from the angel's presence. Are you saying that things don't always turn out as, as you plan? No, they don't, the angel answered. As servants of God, we can't interfere with your free will. We gave you a way of escape for every test of your heart, but you chose the pleasures of this world. Before Jake was able to argue another word, a dazzling white light blocked everything from view. Trembling down on his knees, he found himself face to face with Jesus Christ. The look of sadness on his master's face was more than Jake could bear. Jake, I loved you, Jesus said to him earnestly. You were one of mine. Why did you turn away from me? Why didn't you stay on the path to life? Speechless and devastated, Jake couldn't find a reason. All the excuses he had poured out to the angel seemed pitiful and foolish now. Jesus loved me. I was truly one of his. If only I had known. But of course I should have known. Why didn't I believe? Speaking sadly and with much regret, Jesus said, I know you not. You have forsaken me. And now I have forsaken you. Depart from me. Jake's moment before Christ was over. Devastated and trembling, he turned to the angel and begged, Please, may I at least say goodbye to my family? The angel shook his head. I'm sorry, Jake. But between you and them, there is a great gulf fixed. Your family is in the bosom of Abraham, inheriting the promises God made to all his descendants by faith. There is no passing from here to there. Seven piercing blasts of a trumpet sounded. It was the same trumpet call that Zack heard on the other side. 
Jesus was about to make a very important announcement. Looking up, Jake saw clearly that the crowd had been separated. He was far away from his brother and his family. He was with the rejected, those who were assigned to eternal destruction. He had no idea what that would entail. All he knew was that all hope was gone. It no longer existed for him. He had begged and pleaded and found that there was no longer any door of forgiveness to enter or hope of mercy from his Lord. As a terrifying realization began to sink in, Jake was frozen with fear. To be banished from his family and friends for eternity was an unbelievable nightmare. And not only that, but he was forever banished from God. Chapter 42 When All Hope is Gone Looking around desperately for some familiar face, some companionship, Jake was sure he could see David and Jerry in the distance. As he walked in their direction, he suddenly saw Abby with her parents right nearby. They all seemed inconsolable. Jake drew near and reached out to take Abby's hand. Abby turned away from him in despair. Don't start caring now, she sobbed bitterly. You never cared at all about me. You always thought you were so much better than everyone else. Why didn't you tell me to get baptized? Why didn't you warn me to change my life? You knew this was for real. I would have listened to you, Jake. I would have listened. I looked up to you. And now we've missed out on all that God has promised. I can't bear it. I can't bear it. Jake couldn't think of anything to say. Abby's rejection hurt. Her accusations plunged in like a knife. She was right. After his friends had moved away, he had never really cared about anyone else in the youth group. He had seen the rest as too far gone to be worth saving. And now, here he was, cast out with Abby and the others. He had received the same fate. He was no better at all. Tears came rolling down his cheeks. Everyone on their side of the judgment seat was in mental anguish, weeping and wailing. Brett was no exception. Racked with grief and shaking with fear, he looked over painfully at Jake. Stumbling forward, he reached out to draw him close. Jake, I, I'm so sorry. He sobbed, hugging him tightly. I'm so sorry I led you here. How could I have been so foolish? We should have been on the other side, both of us. But instead, we've missed out on everything. I'm so sorry. Why are you saying sorry to me? Jake cried, holding on to Brett desperately. It's not your fault. Tears were pouring down Brett's face. The angel told me. Brett sobbed tragically. That I led you, one of Jesus' lambs, astray. Forgive me, Jake, please forgive me. He pleaded. I, I chose. I, I chose to follow you. Jake cried. It was true. He had made his own choices. Clinging to Brett like a scared child to his father, Jake gazed tragically at all the miserable people around him. A woman in the distance looked like Jenna. She was racked with grief like everyone else. Had Jenna been rejected as well? There were many people that looked familiar, but Jake was too distraught to reach out her care. After all, there were no longer any words of comfort or hope to offer. Fear intensified within Jake exponentially. If they had missed out on everything, what was going to happen next? Would they all be vaporized and destroyed? Or left here to perish in this barren wilderness? He could hear the tremendous cheers of praise and rejoicing on the other side of the Lord. Before his very eyes, old people were becoming young again. Youths were taking on an incredibly healthy, vigorous glow. All the diverse attire, jeans, shirts, tunics, and various types of clothing from all cultures throughout the ages were being transformed into the most glorious white robes. Everyone was leaping and shouting with a joy beyond description. Suddenly, the vast multitude on the other side broke into a glorious song. It was unlike any music Jake had ever heard before, and they all seemed to know it perfectly. From one end of the crowd to the other, hallelujahs swept through the joyful people as they waved and praised the great king on the throne. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, they sang in a multi-level harmony. 
In an instant, all the angels were at the front with Jesus surrounding his throne. With glorious, silvery, rich voices, they responded in song, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. It was a triumphant melody. Jake had never heard such a crescendo of expression with perfect pitch and tone. He wished it would never end. If only he were one of the singers. But there was nothing he could do about it now. Nothing. Zack! He found himself crying out. Mom! Dad! I love you! I never realized how much you all meant to me. I want to be with you. Please, I want to be with you. Please, don't leave me! He wailed. Never had he yearned so much to be with his family. Falling down to his knees, Jake broke down sobbing. He was in complete and utter despair. Chapter 43 Overjoyed Zach had always loved music, but this was beyond anything he had ever experienced or dreamed. The richness of the sound, the depth of harmony, the glorious voices were far superior to any philharmonic orchestra in the world. His own voice had been enhanced in a remarkable way. Singing with all the other immortals in praise to God vastly transcended the high school musical and even the campfire sing-alongs. Joy burst from his heart, untainted by any other motivation than pure thankfulness to God for the redemption he had freely given. Elation was too simple a word to describe how thankful he was for the future that now stretched out forever. Singing with the others, he poured out the gratitude he felt for God's goodness and mercy. All the promises he had learned about in Sunday school and youth group were now to be fulfilled. He had been chosen by God, however undeserving he felt, to have a part. The group of immortals that Zach stood with was to be the bride of Jesus Christ. They would work closely with Jesus as his chosen friends to bring the world to acknowledge that the Son of God, once despised, rejected, and crucified, was now to be the King of the world. Along with the others, Zach knew he would take part in opposing the invading armies that were to come against Jerusalem. He would tell the world that Jesus was King. He would see the temple of Ezekiel's prophecy built under divine supervision and functioning as a center of worship. Perhaps he would be involved in the construction or landscaping the grounds. He would never die. As Zach rejoiced in the awesome privilege God had extended to him, he gazed around at all the other singing saints. I'll meet Job, he thought excitedly, and David, and Jonathan, Paul and Peter, all the Bible characters that I loved. The song of praise ended with a crescendo of hallelujahs. Zach reached every note without effort. He had no shortage of breath. Heavenly Father, he prayed silently, I am so thankful to be a part of all this. What a blessing it is to be granted this gift of immortality, to take part in the work you have planned for this world. When the song finished, Zach realized that everyone on the left-hand side had disappeared. Jake was gone. Zach was saddened to lose his brother, but it was nothing like the sadness he had felt before becoming immortal. He felt the loss, but he didn't feel panic or despair or inconsolable grief. He didn't have any nagging doubts that God had made the wrong decision. Instead, he felt fully convinced in his heart that Jake had chosen the world and God had rightfully given Jake his true desire. Looking over at his family, Zach was amazed at the changes that had taken place. Uncle Peter looked so young and very familiar. He hardly recognized his grandparents, and even his own mom and dad were dramatically younger looking. Everyone appeared fit and healthy. Not one gray hair or wrinkle could be seen. All physical ailments had been healed. Together they celebrated the divine transformation that had taken place. The instant that Zach wondered where Noah, Brennan, and Hannah were, he spotted each one. He realized the mental access he had to an enormous databank of information. Effortlessly, they came together. 
My forever friends! Zack cheered with great elation. Forever, forever friends. friends! They exclaimed ecstatically, joining hands and rejoicing together. All of them had changed physically, but they were still recognizable. In shining white robes with thick golden belts, they had become like the angels. Zack didn't feel the same stirrings for Hannah as he had felt before. Instead, he felt a warm, solid, loyal friendship that was special in its own way, but not one that would provoke jealousy or sinful desire. Human nature had been dealt a crushing blow. Zack was thankful to be forever free of depravity. There was no longer anything to hide or any thought to cause shame. Thank you for your friendship, Hannah, he said to her earnestly. You gave me the strength to stay the course and choose God's ways. I'm so glad that both of us decided to choose God's ways before it was too late, she smiled back. This is everything I ever wanted. We're here, Zach. God has made us his own, and nothing can ever take us away from him. Chapter 44. A Note from Jake. Translated from Italian. Dear Ella, I should have told you all this at the beginning. I'm sorry that I'm leaving you just when we found out that we're expecting twins. I can only hope that maybe you'll understand after you read this. You often asked why I came to Europe, and I was never able to explain. You often asked why I was so depressed, and I told you it was a medical condition. The truth is, it's actually much deeper than that. Far deeper. Now that I've been conscripted into the Europa Army, I have to tell you the truth. I should have told you everything years ago, but I know how important your religious convictions are to you. I always worried that if I told you the truth, you or your family would turn me into the authorities. That is why I've kept silent. For the last few years, I have lived a lie that has weighed heavily on my mind. Ella, I pretended to be a devout Catholic, just like you, so that you would marry me and I could find work with your family. I'm so sorry for deceiving you all. Your family has been so good to me. Please don't tear up this letter immediately. Please read on. You need to understand what I'm about to tell you, even if you never forgive me. I know that you, like so many people here, think that the new Jews that are in Jerusalem are the source of all the world's problems. Ella, many times I wanted to explain that I knew all about this, but I've been so afraid. Rumors, unfounded reports, and falsified stories have portrayed the man who claims to be the king of the world to be a savage, untrustworthy dictator who will bring the end to all human rights and freedom. But, but I know this man. I saw him personally when he came back to raise the dead and judge those who were responsible to him, just as the Bible foretold. This is the very Lord Jesus Christ that you, as a good Christian, profess to follow. Ella, don't be deceived by the media or any religious authorities. My brother and my whole family are there with Jesus in Jerusalem. They are now immortal. They will never die. They have God's power. No one can fight against immortal beings and win. The God of all creation is on their side. Why am I so depressed? Ten years ago, Jesus, the new king in Jerusalem, rejected me. Jesus Christ rejected me as unworthy to partake in his kingdom, because my heart was with the world, not with him. Jesus is loving and forgiving, but not to those who don't repent of their sins and try to lead others astray. That was me. It has been ten long years of heartbreaking agony and regret for me and my friend Brett. He and I were both rejected by Jesus Christ and transported in some supernatural way to Europe. We didn't have passports or banking cards, so before we came to your farm, we were in a desperate situation. We almost starved. We were homeless for a long time. We were both terribly homesick and depressed. Everything I'd ever hoped for had been taken away from me, both my hopes for this life and the one to come and it was all because of my own foolishness. When we first arrived here, we didn't want to tell anyone what happened to us. 
we were humiliated and resentful that we had been rejected. Eventually, we were arrested as illegal immigrants. Without passports or identification of any kind, we had no way to provide for ourselves or any rational way to explain how we had come to Europe. Had we been able to contact Brett's family in Canada, we might have been able to get the information we needed. But they never responded to our messages, and we never knew why. So we told the authorities the truth, but that only made things worse. They thought we were crazy, absolutely crazy. We were locked up in a ward with all the lunatics and treated as such. They were terrible months. We were beaten by the other prisoners and even one of the guards. It was the cruelest place ever. Since then, I've never told another soul what I know. I'm terrified of returning to prison. People didn't believe our story then, just as I know they won't now. I was thankful to be with Brett, even though he, more than anyone, led me down the wrong path. But I chose to be led. As you know, eventually our passports and banking information came through from the Canadian authorities. Brett and I were able to sort out our identity and citizenship and make arrangements to fly home to Stirling, Nova Scotia. But two days before our flight was to leave, the worldwide earthquake hit. Our hopes were dashed again. Country dwellers like your family fared much better than those in cities. I don't know how Brett and I escaped. Buildings crumbled all around us. Power lines came down. Oil pipes and tanks deep in the ground cracked and leaked and exploded. Fires raged for days. So many people died. Money became worthless and air travel was shut down completely. Since then, Brett and I have had no choice but to remain here in Europe. However, recently I heard that ocean travel is possible again. It was around the time of all the destruction that fear and terror took hold on society. With such frightening events, many Christians like you believe the devil took over the world. The rumor that the new Jews in Jerusalem are the Antichrist and the cause of all the world's woes took off like wildfire. It's not true, Ella. Brett and I knew that when the earthquakes were triggered all around the world, Jesus Christ and the saints had returned to the Mount of Olives. The judgment that began with believers like me was now taking place on the world. Being without television and the internet for so long, I've been able to distance myself from reality. But when we went yesterday to the new media center that just opened in Villa Square, reality hit me hard in many ways. The religious leaders appealed to everyone to join forces against the evil imposter in Jerusalem. They ridiculed this man, who claims to be Jesus Christ the true Messiah, and strongly urged everyone to resist his words and not be deceived by his miracles. They said this new king is the Antichrist. I long to tell you and your family that this is wrong, and that the new king in Jerusalem truly is Jesus Christ. But I've been too afraid. I'm sure your parents would turn against me if I spoke the truth. Maybe you would too. Ella, I will give you a list of passages at the end of this letter. These are the prophecies about what Jesus will do when he sets up God's kingdom on earth. Read through them and compare them with what you have seen and will see happening. Don't be misled by what everyone else is saying, Ella. If you ever have the chance, go to Jerusalem and see for yourself. Talk to the people. You might even meet my twin brother, Zach. Question them. Observe them. I'm sure you will see they speak for God. Look at them carefully. They aren't exactly like us. They are immortal. Jesus even has nail holes in his hands. He's not an imposter. He is the Messiah he claims to be. He's the King of Israel and of the whole world. Ella, you wondered why I was so down after watching the news report? But you see, my heart is completely broken. You are astonished by the size of the temple that is being built in Jerusalem. You are amazed by the incredible topographical changes that have taken place and the beautiful gardens. But Ella, I should have been there helping with the work. Had I appreciated what I had at the time, I would be there now with the rest of my family. Do you remember the two young men you said looked like me? The two that were overseeing the new gardens along the river? I'm sure it was my Uncle Peter and my brother Zach. I know they look younger than me, but understand, Ella, they are immortal. They will never age. I'm sure my Aunt Jess was right there with them in the large group of gardeners. I should have been there too. 
If you ever see another report on Israel, notice the health and vibrancy of those people. I wish with all my heart that I was one of them. I would give anything to have a second chance. If only I could. Europa News spins the interviews in such ridiculous ways. Half the time they don't even translate correctly. I know the immortals would never say the things Europa News claims they've said. They create fear in your society by warning that the work that is going on in Jerusalem is a calculated, sinister revolt against democracy and mankind's rights and freedoms. The UN is foolish to call for an immediate halt to the construction and demand that Jerusalem be declared an international city. I know that you've been involved in raising funds to rebuild the Dome on the Rock, and you feel strongly that the new temple should be demolished since it stands on Arab and Catholic holy ground. But Ella, in this you are fighting against God. It's God's will that this work be done in Jerusalem. It's prophesied in the Bible. Just read Second Samuel 7, Luke 1, verses 31 to 33, Zechariah 6, and Ezekiel chapters 38 to 48. I grew up thinking that I could always make up for the wrong I had done. I believed that there was always another chance. If I made a mistake, I could erase it and do it again. I thought I would always be forgiven if I confessed and repented. I didn't believe that one day it would be too late to change. One day God would say, It's enough, and close the door. I can't even begin to describe how it feels to have missed out on a one and only chance of a lifetime. I would fully repent now if I could. I have changed so much. I know now that God couldn't have offered a greater promise than he did. And I feel absolutely sick every time I stop and think that somehow it wasn't enough for me at that time. I could have lived forever. Truly forever. I could have been with the Lord Jesus Christ. I could have been involved in his work of cleansing the earth of all wickedness and making it a paradise of righteousness that brings glory to God. I could have been with Zach and all my good friends and my family forever. I could have been under the powerful protection of God instead of here in Europe living a lie as an unwelcome foreigner afraid for my life. We never know when the next earthquake may strike or tsunami may hit or outbreak of plague may sweep across this city. I can't even call upon God to protect anyone I love, not even our twins that you are bringing into this world. God doesn't know me. I'm not one of his, and never can be any more. Europe is set to resist Jesus and the saints. Fighting against an army of immortals with God on their side is doomed to failure. How utterly impossible! The outcome of this battle is prophesied in Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. Read the whole chapter, and chapter 18 as well. There you will see the harlot, unfaithful Christianity, riding the beast of Europe, the Ten Kings. It's easy to see that in a short matter of time, Europe will bring about its own destruction. I could never fight against Jesus. But to refuse to fight would bring execution, or worse, imprisonment. To be associated with me may prove harmful to you and your family. I have to get away tonight. I have a plan, but it's risky and dangerous. Th this may be the end. Ella, you're better off without me here. I'm not going to fight against the Son of God, and you won't want to be identified with a traitor. Read the material I've left for you, and, and do your best to get out of this country as soon as you can. I've managed to save up enough money for you to take a ship to North America. Look under our mattress. I've heard that many are accepting Jesus as the true Messiah in distant places. Maybe God will have mercy on you and spare our twins. Maybe you will all live out your lives in the peaceful paradise that will come after the world submits to Christ. Paradise will gradually encompass all of the earth. Jesus will reign for 1,000 years. If my plan succeeds, I will try to return to my hometown in Sterling, Nova Scotia, as soon as I can. I've made such a wreck of my life. Please don't make a wreck of yours. Meet me there if you can. Please teach the twins to love God and obey Him. What I lost can still be yours. Please read and understand God's message for you, and consider carefully the choices you make in the future. If God is on your side, you need not fear anyone or anything else. I love you, and hope we'll be together again soon.
Jake. Chapter 45, A Return to Sterling, Nova Scotia. It was distressing to view the disastrous scene of his hometown, Sterling, Nova Scotia. Having been with Jesus and the other saints in Israel for over 11 years, this was the first time Zach had been sent back to Canada. He had a message to share with his old friends and neighbors, a message which he hoped they would receive. Since becoming immortal, Zach had been fully occupied with God's purpose to make the earth full of his glory. This work had begun in Jerusalem. After years of close daily contact with the Lord Jesus Christ, Zach and the other saints now enjoyed an intimate bond of fellowship with the new king of the world. Under the leadership of Jesus Christ, their Lord, Savior, and friend, they looked forward to ruling the earth with him for a millennium. The time spent with the Lord Jesus Christ had been very eventful. Early on, Zach witnessed the awesome power of God unleashed upon a faithless and immoral world. On the mountains of Israel, the northern confederacy had been overthrown by wild, catastrophic storms, spewing hailstones and fire. The defeat of the northern confederacy after their invasion of Israel had been a spectacular demonstration that God's natural elements are far more powerful than any sophisticated weaponry mankind can create. Many people, Jews, Palestinians, Russians, Libyans, Ethiopians, and Iranians, perished. When Jesus Christ's feet touched the Mount of Olives, he triggered a massive earthquake which set off many more along the tectonic plates emanating from the mount. It was at that time that Jesus and the saints revealed themselves to the world. The powerful earthquake also split the Mount of Olives in two, completely altering the topography of the Holy Land and elevating Mount Zion above all the hills round about. Everywhere in the world, buildings, transportation infrastructure, and many other towering human edifices collapsed and were burned up by raging infernos. After those early days of battle and destruction, Zach and Noah worked joyfully with the whole Eden Tree crew and many others to transform the land of promise. With an enormous new temple being constructed on Mount Zion, there was plenty of landscaping to do around the grounds. Uncle Peter had been assigned to oversee the development of the gardens along the river flowing out from the new temple structure. Having no financial or material restraints, with spirit wisdom to guide their plans, and vigorous, immortal strength that never weakened, working with Uncle Peter was a joyful experience. In the daytime, they would work on the gardens. In the evenings and on the Sabbath, they would spend hours teaching many eager Jews and Arabs about the true God of Israel and his righteous ways. All around Mount Zion, the transforming work of the saints created fantastic landscapes, parks, and gardens that were now unrivaled in the world. The promised land was cleansed, transformed, and astonishingly beautiful. Even the river that flowed from the temple was crystal clear, refreshing to drink, and full of unique, colorful fish that could be seen clearly from the shore. Zach marveled at how fast the trees had grown beside the river of life. Those special trees were always in bloom, perpetually bearing one of their twelve different varieties of fruit each month. He had tasted each kind and was delighted by all. Not only was the fruit delicious to eat, but the trees provided healing for the mortal population. While the Eden Tree crew had been involved in gardening, Uncle James was assigned the role of treasurer, keeping record of the tribute generously flowing in from the nations surrounding Israel. He had become close friends with a man named Joseph, a martyr from the 1700s. He'd even worked with the Ethiopian eunuch and Matthew the tax collector, who were organizing and providing materials to all those constructing the temple. Noah, David, Solomon, Hiram, Bezalel, and many thousands of others had followed the divine plans to construct the magnificent edifice of God's temple, long foretold in the latter part of Ezekiel's prophecy. Aunt Sandra, Aunt Jess, Verity, Hannah, and Kara had been very involved with one of the schools for the children whose parents were immortal. Esther had long since graduated, and even Aunt Jessica's eldest daughter was now a young adult. In the early years, they had loved seeing their mom and their aunties at school every day. 
Often the children were taken on excursions to help with the landscaping activities or to go fishing in the sparkling living waters that ran into the former Dead Sea. It was no longer a dead sea. It abounded with life. During the night, while the mortal population slept, the immortal workers, never weary, would gather together with Jesus the King and talk over the events of the day. Jesus had a vision for the land which gave all of them direction. It was in those nightly sessions that Zach had truly come to know his Lord as a friend, a brother, and the righteous leader that every one of them rejoiced to follow. Never in the history of mankind had such a wise, kind, righteous, and completely incorruptible king held the reins of power. Jesus Christ was God manifest on earth. For the victory over sin that Jesus accomplished in his life and death, God had given Jesus the name that is above every name. With great joy in his heart, Zach eagerly looked forward to the day when the whole earth would know and appreciate the new era that was about to be ushered in for 1,000 years. The whole earth was going to be filled with God's glory, as he had intended from the very beginning. With all the preparatory construction work now complete, the Jewish people converted to Christ, and the Arabians bringing gifts, Jerusalem was ready for the people of the world to come and learn of God's ways. Zach had been sent to Sterling, Nova Scotia, with the others in his delegation. They had a mission to accomplish, if they could convince the people of Sterling to cooperate. All throughout the world, the saints had been given the commission to proclaim Jesus as King and invite everyone and invite everyone to worship him in Jerusalem. With the assistance of the immortal saints, transportation was free and instantaneous from any part of the world. Jesus had sent his messengers to their hometowns, if there were survivors in those places that would recognize them. Others were sent to regions where the gospel had never been preached. Hovering above Sterling, Nova Scotia, Zach and the others in his delegation viewed the desolate city. The once beautiful harbor town now lay in blackened ruins. The boardwalk along which they had often walked was no longer there. Only seaweed and rubble lined the coast. Massive overpasses had fallen on the roads and buildings below, blocking all transportation through the city. Hospitals and apartment buildings still lay in charred concrete ruins. The high school was only a pile of bricks and twisted metal. When the earthquakes and terrible fires ravaged across the earth, the economies of the world had collapsed. Without transportation, money, or electricity, the once modern, civilized countries quickly reverted to primitive conditions. Only in the last year had some of the bigger cities restored a grid of electrical power and revived some means of transportation. However, fuel deliveries were still impossible in most areas of the world, and food shortages continued. Water for many was difficult to obtain. Devastating violence had broken out in many places simply over access to water alone. From what Zach had learned from the Lord Jesus Christ, Nova Scotia was functioning better than many other places of the world. Bodies of fresh water had always been abundantly accessible in the eastern Canadian provinces. Looking down in the countryside from above, Zach could see that makeshift shelters lined all the freshwater lakes and ponds. As Zach viewed the ruins of Sterling, he hoped the people in his hometown would choose to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as the new ruler of the world. They would have so much to gain. Their community would be rebuilt with the help of the immortal workers, and they would learn the righteous ways of God. If the people of Sterling refused to believe and took sides with the European armies that were now preparing to attack Jerusalem, they could only anticipate further destruction and no rain. Looking at the various makeshift villages, Zach spotted the shack where his former acquaintances lived. It was to those two friends first that he had been sent. Uncle Peter and Aunt Jess were to find the people that they knew, Uncle James and Aunt Sandra, Uncle Thomas and Aunt Purity were also part of the Sterling delegation, as were Zach's parents. His father, Andrew, once the pastor of the largest church in town, knew more survivors than any of the others. Altogether, they had many to find and encourage. Zach was not only traveling with his family, but he had made a special request to bring along a friend. During the time he had spent in Jerusalem, Zach had developed strong friendships with many of the faithful of old. Laboring to restore the land of Israel, he often worked and toured with people he'd once read about in the Bible. He met Job, 
and all of his fourteen children, now resurrected and immortal, he met Gideon, Samson, and even Jonathan. They showed him their favorite haunts and locations where important battles had been fought, with their assistance, he discovered special places where God appeared to his people in the past and vital decisions had been made. Zach and Hannah had toured Geba with Jonathan and Mephibosheth. Together they had climbed the cliff where the Philistine outpost had once been. As they climbed, Jonathan described in dramatic fashion how it felt to be holding onto the rocky hillside, reaching from one precipitous toehold to another all the while looking up to see the mocking faces of the Philistine soldiers and praying earnestly for God's deliverance. When Zach learned that his mission was to go back to Sterling and that two of his old friends from high school were still alive, he knew they would be overjoyed to meet Jonathan and hear his stories of faith firsthand. Jonathan was enthusiastic to call the world to worship Jesus Christ and eagerly agreed to join him. Before the Bryant family and friends separated to find their various acquaintances, they visited the site of Ocean View Lodge. Examining the vacant lot carefully, Uncle Peter concluded that during the earthquake, the ocean waves had risen above the cliff and washed the foundations of the house away. The beautiful gardens had also been eroded. Here and there, a hardy perennial was trying to make a new start, desperately vying for a presence among the overgrown weeds. There's much work to be done, Uncle Peter said cheerfully. This earth will surpass all its former glory once the inhabitants recognize Jesus Christ as their king. Separating to fulfill their various missions, Zach and Jonathan set off toward a quiet lake shore. There were very few people left in the actual city of Sterling. Since the earthquake, cities had become garbage-strewn, rat-infested, concrete wastelands. Survivors were forced to seek refuge in the countryside where they could grow their own food and have reliable sources of water. Zack didn't have to ask any strangers where his friends might be. God was directing his way. With a simple request, he and Jonathan were transported to the very spot. They found themselves outside a large wooden shelter. It was well built with salvaged lumber. Fruit trees stood nearby, pruned and bearing heavily. A stack of firewood was piled next to the house. Cows grazed contentedly in a field and chickens scratched in the yard. Inside a greenhouse, improvised from old glass windows, tomato plants hung heavy with fruit. Corn grew well in the neat, cultivated gardens. Hoeing weeds in that productive garden was a tall black man and his wife. Sitting in the garden, pulling up weeds by hand, was his crippled brother. A young girl was swinging on a tire that hung in a maple tree next to the house. She was singing an old familiar tune. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jaden, Isaiah, Zach called out. I'm so happy to see you both alive. The tall black man stood up straight and looked over with a quizzical expression. Seeing the two men in white linen robes and dazzling gold belts, he and the rest of his family were instantly fearful. The little girl stopped her happy song and ran to her mother's side. Uh, who, who are you? Jaden said, trembling. Uh, are you angels? Don't be afraid. Zack smiled. I'm your old friend, Zack. Zack Bryant? Jaden said with utter disbelief. Isaiah looked up with great interest. Yes, I'm Zack Bryant. But you look so young, so much younger than me. And where did you get those clothes, man? Why have you been away so long? Isaiah called out sorrowfully. One day you're there, and the next day your whole family just disappears. Some from our church went missing, too. Jaden stated with a frown. He cried out, But why didn't God take us? We've always tried to live right. Why did he leave us here? Zach could read his friend's thoughts and understood their deep pain and confusion. Through the Spirit of God, he could also answer their questions. God called everyone that was responsible to him to judgment, Zach said gently. Some of your church leaders and, and friends knew that they weren't preaching the true gospel message and failed to act on that knowledge. They were afraid of losing their job or their reputations. They didn't love truth, so they deceived themselves and others with lies. Jesus told them to depart from him. He didn't know them. Regardless of the good works they had done, 
They weren't careful to follow his commands. They never truly knew our Lord. Then what about us? Isaiah asked. Why are we still here? We didn't get judged. We just got left. In his mercy, God saw you have honest hearts. Zach smiled. God has spared you and has given you a second chance to believe his truth. So God gave you eternal life? Jaden pondered, looking at Zach curiously. What about your brother? Why isn't Jake with you? Zach began with his story. He told them about being called away to the judgment seat. Sadly, he admitted that the angel had reproved him for not trying harder to share truth with his friends. I'm sorry, Jaden. He apologized earnestly. I wish we had discussed our beliefs long before we did. The angel told me that if we had, you would have been receptive. I regret all the time I spent running away from God before I changed my life. If only those hours had been spent sharing God's offer of salvation. We were just always too busy with other things. Jaden nodded in dismay. I'm as much to blame as you. With a look of concern, he probed, But, but what about Jake? Why isn't Jake with you? Looking down sadly, Zach told them his brother's tragic story. There were tears in Jaden's eyes. That breaks my heart. I'm going to miss him terribly. He moaned. I should have said more. I knew he was heading somewhere bad. I just thought he was stronger. I always thought he was stronger. For a while they stood quietly as Jaden and Isaiah grieved their friend's loss. Eventually, Jaden broke the silence. You've been given life, Zach. You've seen our Lord. Tell us about him. As Zach described his encounters with the Lord Jesus Christ, his friends were enthralled. Jesus' righteous character and godly wisdom are beyond reproach, Zach told them. This is a king who will rule the world with a perfect balance of justice and mercy. No one will sway his judgment with bribes or charm. Never has the world seen such a king. Jesus is the perfect manifestation of God. Well, Zach continued on to explain what it is like to be made immortal, to never feel pain, weariness, or sorrow. Jaden and Isaiah listened in amazement. They longed to have a part. And I've brought someone special with me, Zach told them, putting his hand on Jonathan's shoulder. You see, Jesus Christ, the king who now sits on David's throne, has raised the dead. All the faithful you've read about in the Bible are now alive again and immortal like me. I've been getting to know many of them, and I thought I'd introduce you to someone I know you admire. With a teasing smile, Zach asked, Can you guess who I brought with me? How many guesses do we get? Jaden asked. Hey, this is like 20 questions. Isaiah laughed, his dark face lighting up eagerly. Are you in the Old Testament? He asked the stranger. I am. Jonathan smiled. Isaiah guessed correctly after only three questions. You brought Jonathan to us? Jaden marveled. You remembered. Jaden and Isaiah were eager to talk. We read the book you gave us. Isaiah recalled with a nod in Zach's direction. We learned so much about your friend here, Jonathan. What do you say for yourself? Jaden asked Jonathan. How did you stay unselfish? How did you not feel envy towards David? With their questions and promptings, Jonathan began telling his life story. Jaden's family listened, transfixed, as Jonathan told of his deep feelings for his father. He described the difficult balance he tried to maintain between loyalty to his father, the king, and his love for David, his friend. He told them of the hope he always held that one day he and David would live as immortal saints in God's kingdom. This vision of hope, Jonathan said, allowed me to look beyond what was temporary. My father was all about power and keeping the royal lineage in our family. He failed to remember that it was God who had given him the kingdom in the first place. As for me, what I wanted most was the future kingdom of God. And here I am. I'm now part of the most glorious kingdom ever. With a broad smile, Jonathan exclaimed, God's kingdom is now here on the earth. The Lord Jesus Christ is going to usher in a time of peace and prosperity for all mankind. God has given to his son, Jesus Christ, David's throne in Jerusalem, just as he promised so long ago. If you submit to his rule and worship him, your land will be rebuilt and beautiful again. Sounds amazing, Jaden exclaimed. Please, will you sit for a while and tell us more? Zach and Jonathan happily accepted the request. 
Throwing down his hoe, Jaden came close to Isaiah so that his crippled brother could climb up onto his back. His wife excused herself to bring a little refreshment. Everyone else gladly took seats in the homemade wooden chairs down by the water's edge. There, in the serene setting, with the lake lapping quietly against the shore, the whole family gathered around. Jaden's wife poured glasses of cool, creamy milk for everyone. Their daughter brought around a bowl of fresh strawberries. Everything tasted so good. Zach and Jonathan explained many things about the true gospel message in the kingdom Jesus was establishing on the earth. Since Jaden and Isaiah had read through all the books Zach had given them, the whole family was very receptive to the message. I always felt that God has been looking after us, Jaden told Zach, even though I couldn't understand why he left us here. So many people died in the fires and plagues and the destruction, but Isaiah and I escaped every time. I always remembered you saying there would be cleansing fires, but the planet would survive. With a chuckle, he added. And here we are. Then he added sadly, Melissa died, you know. Yes, I know, Zach said simply. She had no desire for God in her heart, but God saw something good in you and Isaiah. He has watched over you like a shepherd. My wheelchair didn't survive, Isaiah mumbled. But Jaden has been lugging me about. Moved with compassion, Zach longed to act. Healing power was there for him to use, but the time wasn't right, not just yet. Are you willing to come with us and proclaim the good news that Jesus is the king? Zach asked. Everyone in the family agreed. Standing up and reaching out their hands, Zach and Jonathan took hold of the others. In an instant, they were all by the shores of Sherbrooke Lake, where many residents on the west side of Sterling had set up shelter. That was so fast, Isaiah marveled. It would take us a whole day to walk here. How did that happen? Jaden asked. His wife and daughter seemed dazed. God's power is far beyond anything man has ever dreamt or imagined, Zach told them. Do you have the power to get me a better wheelchair? Isaiah begged wistfully. Zach only smiled. He knew the full extent of God's power and was waiting for the right moment. For the rest of that day, they called out to the people around the lake to come, bring their Bibles if they had them, and hear about Jesus Christ, the long-awaited king of the world. When a crowd had assembled on the banks of the lake, Zach and Jonathan told everyone about the work that had been going on in the land of Israel. The crowd was fairly attentive until a young man stood up and shouted, It's the Antichrist who leads the work in Israel. Don't listen to these preachers or you'll be deceived. For years our pastor told us that the Antichrist was coming, and now he's here. Antichrist is this so-called king in Jerusalem. Jesus Christ isn't here yet. Don't listen to these men. Antichrist is doing exactly what our pastor said he would do in Israel. We're almost to the end of the seven years of tribulation. The real Jesus will return from heaven soon to destroy this deceiver. These men are wolves in sheep's clothing. Others rallied around the young man. It's the Antichrist who builds a temple for the Jews. Antichrist will say he's the Messiah, but he's the devil in disguise. These men are wrong. They are liars. The crowd became confused and the commotion grew so loud that nothing could be heard above it. Zach and Jonathan stood patiently waiting for an opportunity to proclaim the truth. It was Jaden who silenced the crowd and convinced the people to give the newcomers a chance to prove their claims from Scripture. Zach showed them many passages as evidence that everything Jesus was doing in Jerusalem had been prophesied long before in the Bible. There were many questions. Some people didn't believe, and some threatened to throw Zach and Jonathan out of town. Patiently, Zach and Jonathan encouraged the audience to examine the message carefully in their own Bibles. In the midst of the crowd was a pretty dark-haired young woman with two small babies in her arms. She was thin and constantly nursing one of her babies. The other looked very frail and lay listlessly in her arms. Zach could see that the infants were in great need. Every time Zach looked her way, the woman's eyes, her haunted eyes, were transfixed on him. Why is she looking at me that way? Zach wondered. Yet access to information about this woman was not forthcoming. Often, to wonder was to know, instantaneously. But not everything was readily accessed. There were still future mysteries that God hadn't yet revealed, and perplexing problems that even the immortals had to puzzle through together to resolve. There must be a good reason God is keeping this hidden, Zach thought. I'll wait a little longer. Perhaps she will come to me after Isaiah is. 
Show us proof. An older man challenged. If you really are immortal, if Jesus is the king of the world like you say, then give us some miracles. Show us what you can do. Zack looked toward his lame friend, slumped on the ground beside his older brother. Both of them were looking at him expectantly. With a smile, Zack stepped forward. It was time for God's power to be revealed. Isaiah's eyes opened wide as Zack drew near. A hush fell over the crowd and they stepped back to give him room. You see this young man here? Zack called out, pointing to Isaiah. I've known Isaiah since we were both children. I grew up in Sterling, Nova Scotia, just like many of you. Isaiah has a rare bone disease that left him crippled. All his life he's had to depend on others to help him get around. But I've never heard him complain. There were many times I realized my own poor attitude when I saw Isaiah's positive spirit. No one said a word in reply. God can move mountains with a word, Zach told them. He has power over the storms, the pestilence, and the sea. God has given his power to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules in Jerusalem. Jesus has shared this power with those he raised from the dead. As it is written in Isaiah 35, this is the glorious time when the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the dumb sing. Turning to his friend, Zach smiled warmly and held out his hand. Isaiah grasped it eagerly. The crowd waited in silent anticipation. With a heart full of joy, Zach spoke to his friend. In the name of God and his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the new King of the world, I say to you, Isaiah, rise up and walk. The crowd pressed forward to see if anything would happen. Isaiah looked up in utter astonishment. His expression changed to awe as he felt his legs grow longer and become filled with strength. Ecstatic, he leaped up. Isaiah was amazed at how tall he'd become and the surge of energy he felt inside muscles that had been weak and useless all his life. Impulsively, he broke into a traditional African dance with legs that supported him and responded to everything he wanted them to do. The crowd went wild with joy. Jaden and his wife hugged each other and wept tears of gratitude. God be praised! Jaden sobbed, falling down on his knees. Jesus is king! Jesus Christ is king! Let's worship him. He is the only king we want to serve. Isaiah raised his voice with a similar cheering cry. All the people echoed their praise to God. Even Zach and Jonathan joined in. With a rapt smile, Zach looked up and prayed. Heavenly Father, I thank you immensely for the privilege of healing my friend. Your mercy is great in sparing their lives through all the judgments that have been unleashed on this earth. May they learn and grow in their knowledge and love for you. My child is blind, a mother called out anxiously. Can you restore his sight? I'm dying of cancer, an old man said, coming forward, his face lined with desperation. A large tumor was visible on his neck. It's been years since any one of us has had access to hospital care. Can you heal us all? Suddenly, there was a rush of requests. Zach and Jonathan healed everyone through the power of God. Nothing is too hard for God, they said. As the excitement grew, Zach and Jonathan climbed onto a high section of concrete so they wouldn't be mobbed by the crowd. Zach looked out over the ever-growing mass of people and smiled to see his friend Jaden embracing Isaiah. The brothers now stood shoulder to shoulder, eye to eye. I'm looking forward to bringing that family to visit Jerusalem, Jonathan said to Zach with a smile. Mephibosheth will love to make their acquaintance. Zach agreed. Isaiah and Mephibosheth are kindred spirits, and Jaden and Isaiah will be thrilled to see Jesus Christ and walk through the promised land. I know they will encourage everyone here to make the same journey. Jonathan hushed the crowd, and then he spoke. People of Sherbrooke Lake, if you truly want to worship God in truth and serve his son, our king, who sits on David's throne, then you must learn his ways. In this new order, Jesus will not tolerate everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. The kingdom of God's Son will be one of righteousness and holiness. If you are willing, tomorrow Zach and I will tell you about the new king and the way he wants us to live. In the morning we will have classes for everyone who wants to attend. In the afternoon we will begin to clean up the rubble to beautify and restore function to your town. Even with all the miracles the crowd had seen, there were still doubters in the midst. How will you clean up all the rubble? One man retorted. 
Have you seen the enormous chunks of concrete? Not even a thousand men could move one of them. Another fellow echoed the same sentiments. We haven't used bulldozers for years. Do you have any idea how much fuel they consume? Can you make fuel in some magical way? We do nothing by magic, Zack admonished the crowd. What you've seen us do this day is by the power of God alone. But why would we require fuel or bulldozers? He smiled calmly. Who can move mountains into the sea? Isaiah was smiling and nodding. God can, he proclaimed loudly. Amid laughing jeers from the mockers, clapping and shouts of support from the others, Jaden silenced the crowd. Listen to me. We've all seen the power of God today, in ways that yesterday we would not have believed possible. My brother can walk. Sally's son can see. Malcolm has been cured of cancer. These men in white robes are not mortal men like us. These men have the power of God. If they believe they can help clean up our city, then let's have faith and lend them a hand. The crowd called out their approval. Isaiah was the loudest of all, leaping into the air. Zack was filled with joy. He knew that most of the people were sincere. Tomorrow they would begin to restore Sterling both spiritually and physically for the Lord. But for now, it was getting dark and the people needed to rest. He and Jonathan would spend the night conferring with the others in the delegation to make plans for Sterling's recovery. Zack looked over curiously in the direction of the girl with the troubled eyes. She still had not come to them, but he sensed that her faith was weak. It was easy to see that time was running out for her children. Father, please allow me to help this woman, Zack prayed. The request was granted. Reading her mind, Zack understood that while the young woman had seen the miracles, she was still very confused about Antichrist. The strong words of warning she had heard that day from the young man who had shouted out to the crowd terrified her. She didn't know who to believe. She was alone without a friend. When she glanced furtively again in his direction, Zack smiled kindly. As the people filed off to the makeshift shelters for the night, Zack walked over to the dark-haired girl. In her arms, one baby cried unhappily, while the other still slept, his limbs dangling weakly from his body. Trembling as Zack approached, the woman held her children closer and looked down at the ground. "'What can I do for you and your children?' Zack asked in fluent Italian. With God's power, he could speak easily in any language. Hearing her native dialect was a great comfort to the young woman. I fled Europe, she told him, very happy to communicate in her own language. I've run out of money and I have no shelter or food. My children are starving and I don't speak English very well. No one understands a word I say. Suddenly, Zack knew exactly who the girl was even though he had never met her. He reeled with the understanding. Pain was no longer a sensation he felt, but compassion overwhelmed him. This woman had been on a long, agonizing journey. She had traveled by ship to a foreign country, tormented by doubts, with faith as small as a mustard seed, hoping desperately that her husband, her dead husband, had spoken the truth. My little boy, she said, tears welling up in her dark brown eyes. He just sleeps all the time. I know he must be hungry, but he has no strength to nurse. Without a word, Zack reached for the baby boy. The woman gave him over willingly. Touching the boy's head gently, Zack smoothed back his soft blonde hair. The baby slowly opened his eyes. Zack looked down fondly. The little boy's mouth and nose were much like his mother's, but the eyes... The hazel brown eyes were just like his dad's. Father, thank you for bringing these children to me. Zack prayed earnestly. Thank you for your great mercy and your power to give and sustain life. Please, Father, I beg that you will heal them. May they both learn of you and your ways and live long upon this earth. With Zack's loving touch, life flowed back into the small limp body. As his mother watched in astonishment, the baby boy filled out and grew stronger. A ruddy pink glow enlivened his face. With a gurgling laugh, he reached up with his tiny hand to touch Zack's chin. You healed my baby, the woman sobbed happily. Thank you, thank you so much. You must have the power of God. Yes, Ella, Zack said, looking at her kindly and steadily. Little Jacob will be fine now. I'm so glad you named him after his father. You know our names? She questioned in surprise. The surprise gave way to courage. May I, may I ask you a question, she begged. 
Please do. Zack smiled. My husband, she began hesitantly, he told me to come to this place. He wasn't, wasn't made immortal like you. He's not with us anymore. They killed him when he tried to escape. Yes, I know. Zack replied gently, looking back down at the happy child in his arms. Did you, by any chance, she continued anxiously in Italian, did you know him? Zack smiled sadly. Yes, he said. I knew him well. I loved him dearly. Jake was my brother, my twin. Ella burst out crying, and in alarm, the baby girl she was holding did the same. Don't worry, Zack assured her kindly. You've come to the right place. You made a good choice, Ella, and God has guided you safely here. Reaching out, Zack laid his hand upon the baby girl. Immediately, strength and vigor returned to her tiny, wasted body as well. She smiled up at Zack. It was a smile that touched him deeply. Holding the baby boy protectively, Zack saw Jaden and Isaiah talking eagerly to Jonathan about making the trip to Jerusalem. Turning back to Ella, Zack took her arm. I'll personally make sure you're all cared for, he promised, leading her toward his friends. I know just the family who will gladly take you in. Acknowledgements. Eleven Weeks is the fourth and last novel in the first Anna Tikva series. Years ago, I was asked by a young teen to write another story involving the resurrection and reunion of all the characters in the series. I was hesitant to do this, knowing that such an end times novel would necessitate a lot of speculation and a careful balancing of God's mercy and judgment. Inadequate as I am, I began to see the need for such a book. Although we are living in the last days, bombarded daily with signs from God that his prophetic word is being fulfilled, apathy, disillusionment, and the enticing pull of the world are causing many to fall away. As a fellow battle-weary soldier, this story is an attempt to encourage myself, my family, and all who believe Jesus will return to persevere and overcome to the end. All four books in this first series are available on the Magnify Him Together website under the Teen section, check out audiobooks. Many footnotes are included in each paperback copy relating to Bible passages that support what is being said. Hard copies of the first two books can be found through www.cssorg.au or Google Christelphian Scripture Study Services. An Invitation to Forever and Eleven Weeks are available on Amazon. Just search for Anna Tikva or email anatikva at yahoo.ca. Thank you, and I pray that we will meet in God's kingdom very soon.